How old do you think your grandma is? Think I'm older than mommy and daddy? 21. Oh, that's perfect. I like that mm-hmm. age. We actually call her grandmother Yingying, which is the Chinese word for grandmother on the father's side of the family. Uh, I called him, I call him Grandpa Foot. We in our native language in Hindi, we call them Dada and Dadi. My other grandmother would be Maman Bazur, which is Persian for grandmother. Which is true means old woman in King Rwanda. I called her Safta, which is a Hebrew word for grandma. Everybody called her Mami Tita. We called her Mima, Mima and Dede. Grandma. Hi, I'm Steph. And I'm Robin. Welcome to Stories from Grandparents, the podcast where we share stories about and from grandparents. Okay, thank you so much for joining us today. Our pleasure. We have Reagan here. Can you tell me how old you are, Reagan? Four. Four. And who are we sitting here with? Grandma, <laughs> Mommy, yeah. and Robin. That's right. What's your grandma's name? Sue. Good job. <laughs> That's right. Do you remember some of the things we wanted to ask Grandma? What was your school like whenever you were little? When I was little, what was my school like? Um, when I was little, I lived in a different city. So I lived in a city called Regina, which is in the province of Saskatchewan. And if you wanted to drive to Regina, that would probably take you about four days. It's a long way away. And I went to a school where, um, when, you know, you're not going to, this isn't going to mean anything to you, but it's when the Beatles first became very important singers, the Beatles. And there's, you have some Beatles music at home. And we had a teacher, Miss Hume, in grade two, and she loved the Beatles. So sometimes in school, she would play the Beatles music for us. And we got to stand up at our desk and dance. That was very rare for way back then. What's special to you about being a grandma? Oh, there's so much. It, it's, uh, it's overwhelming, the emotions that you feel. Um, you know, first off, watching your children become parents, I mean, I, I still get very emotional about it. It's, uh, it's just incredible to think that we have nurtured someone to the stage where they are actually ready to take on parenthood themselves. And... Um, and they're doing wonderfully. I mean, it, it's so, uh, it's, it's, it's sort of, um, I'm verifying my own self. You know? Yeah, it must it's be very validating. Yeah. Validating, yeah, very validating experience. And, uh, and they're doing so well. I'm just really pleased with them. What was Daddy like whenever he was little? What was he like? He was so cute. He was so cute. He had these big, beautiful blue eyes. And he liked to play. He played a lot with his big sister, Andrea. And he learned to ride his bike very early without training wheels because he has his big sister, Andrea, and he had to uh, follow her all around. But, you know, sometimes he'd have accidents. He broke his arm, I think, one (gasps) time playing soccer. So he was just a really nice little kid to have around. Lots of fun and very cute. You didn't know your daddy broke his arm? Did you know he used to play soccer? Mm -hmm. He did know that, yeah. And he hurt hurt his knee playing soccer, too, twice. What was your whole house like? Our house, when daddy was little? You know what? It's the same house that grandma and grandpa are still living in. Oh. Yep, it's the same house. Yeah. That's nice. We didn't move around very much, no. And the, and the room that's your room now is, is the room that was Daddy's room when he was little. Oh, my goodness. What was your bad dream like whenever you were little? My bad dream when I was little. Or bedroom. Oh, bedroom. Good, because I couldn't think of what a bad dream would have been. <laughs> well, actually, um, you know, you might not know, but I had two brothers and two sisters. So my, my, you know, you've got your uncles and your aunts. And so there was, and I also had a, my older sister had a room all by herself. And so my grandma and grandpa had a, great grandma and great grandpa had a room all to themselves. And I slept with my sister, Debbie, and the two boys slept in bunk beds in their rooms. And before 
I could go to sleep at night. My sister would bother me and bother me until I tickled her back. And then once I tickled her back, she was happy and she could go to sleep. When you think about Reagan growing up right now, and then you think about your own childhood, yeah. like what are some of the biggest differences you see? Um, I think the world's a much scarier place now than it was when I was growing up. Uh, you know, what with what's going on online, and I don't know, there just seems to be a lot more mental health issues out there. It's not the same kind of experience that I grew up with. I mean, there was, you never heard about things like that. You know, it was, you lived in the neighborhood, everybody on the neighborhood street knew everyone. I mean, there was like a protective circle around you in your own, in your own neighborhood because everyone knew each other and, and it was just very safe. I don't know. It seems a little more scary to me than that, you know, and I, I'm not sure I'd be well equipped to handle it. Yeah. These days, I mean, there's some real challenges when you think about everything going on online. And I mean, there's just a lot to think about and to figure out how to handle. And I, I think I would find that quite intimidating these days. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I can think of even the differences from when I was growing up mm -hmm. to current. And like, I remember when we first got Internet. Right. Yep. And uh, like dial up and yeah. Yeah, connect. <laughs> but like one of the first social networking things we had was called MSN, like a messenger, mm -hmm. just like, you know, little pop up windows where you chat with your friends. And it was like if our Internet was down, which was often, mm -hmm. um, it was like the end of, end the, of world. the world. What do you mean? Look, an encyclopedia. What is an encyclopedia? Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody knew those mm -hmm. things yet. And so, yeah, I think kids. Uh, are growing up with uh, so much social, like technology has created all this social connection, but also so much opportunity for social exclusion. And, and social isolation. Yeah, yeah. 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 And that constant need for it. Yes. You know, I was thinking about that because you can walk down the street and there'll be bums out uh, pushing carriages and stuff like that. And typically they're pushing with one hand and they're on their phone with the other hand. Now, when we used to take the kids out for a walk, we'd be talking. It didn't matter the age. You'd say, oh, look at the kitty. See the kitty. You'd talk nonstop the whole time you're pushing the stroller. And I see a lot of moms out with their kids on their phones. And I think that, you know, that's, those are really important missed opportunities to build a really solid foundation with your children. Yeah. And I find that a little bit scary, too. Yeah, yeah. for sure. The other thing is, you know, there's just so much information out there these days. Mm -hmm. So much information. I think, again, that would totally intimidate me. I mean, there's all kinds of books on sleep training and, you know, you have uh, lactation specialists and there's this kind of a specialist. I mean, I, that would really kind of drive me crazy thinking that I'm inadequate and I had to go and see all these specialists. When, when we were born, mom had her parents basically, and maybe a bit of a community in the town she lived in to get, to get um, uh, information and advice on how to raise a baby. Uh, when my kids came along, there was one book on the market. It was like Dr. Spock, and you had to read Dr. Spock. And then, you know, now there's all kinds of books, and there's all kinds of specialists, and there's all kinds of advice, and, you know, having to, to try and um, dig your way through all that and figure out what's the advice that's going to work for you and are you just can you just accept it and move on and not keep looking for more advice I think it's exhausting it must be exhausting to kind of sift through all that information and decide what's going to work for you yeah and so intimidating for intimidating for sure yeah. and it and I think it causes you as a parent to question yourself mm -hmm. because if I'm not doing it according to the way this guy says I should be doing it or this person Am I doing it wrong? Mm -hmm. And chances are you're not doing it wrong if it's comfortable for you. Mm -hmm. But you're you're you lose the faith to trust in yourself. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, and I think that's a I think that's a bit of a threat to some parents. Would be to me, I have to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. It'd be totally anxiety provoking yeah. in many ways. Yeah. And just like kind of looking back on a simpler time where people just didn't have those worries. That's you know, right. You just relied on your family to pass down those skills. That's right. And you relied on yourself a lot more. Yeah. You know, you really did. So, you know, if you, 
I mean, it used to be, well, you can't rock the baby all the time because you're going to spoil the baby. Well, by the time I had my last one, I thought, no, the heck with that. This is my last baby. I'm going to rock him to death. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it was wonderful. Yeah. And he's not, uh, he's not particularly spoiled. He's not, you know, clinging to his mother's apron. He's married. I mean, he's a, he's a competent individual. You know, it's, this is Chris? This is Nick. Oh. This is my baby. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, no, we had three. Oh, I see. He was our gift. Okay. He was yeah. our gift, yeah. yeah. And he's fine, you know, so I'm kind of thinking, oh, geez, I wish I hadn't listened to that, and I rocked my first two as much as I wanted to rock them, you yeah. know. It's silly how you get hung up on on what other people say. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Mm-hmm. What happened whenever Daddy got in trouble? <laughs> well, um... It depended on what kind of trouble he got into. So depending on what it was, when he was older, much older, and he was in high school, and sometimes he'd come home late at night, later than he was supposed to come home. And so what Grandma would do is I'd say to him, okay, uh, I'd get him up early in the morning, and I'd say to him, that's it, you're working with me all day today. I don't care if you're tired, you missed your curfew. So we cleaned the basement, we did all kinds of work in the garage, and he had to stay right beside Grandma and work with me while we did it. And then he figured out that's not a good idea to come in too late. Mm, that sounds awful. <laughs> <laughs> I think... Uh, I think the one thing that has really changed, in, apart from all the knowledge that we have now, is uh, the whole approach to discipline is quite different. When we were growing up, there was a lot of cor- uh, you know corporal punishment, if you will. You know, you like get physical strap- discipline. Yeah. yeah, physical discipline. Yeah, and uh, we decided when we became parents, my husband and I, that that wasn't for us. We weren't going to be able to do that. And I think there was a lot in that generation that decided that was not the appropriate way to um, to discipline. And so we moved forward with uh, an approach of um, uh, consequences related to the offense, mm-hmm. if you will, mm-hmm. and, and immediate consequences. And, you know, I see that the kids are, are doing that kind of thing too. It's like, you know, you... you there's no nothing physical going on. It might be removed from the room or whatever, but it's um, it's a much smarter way to discipline children. And also, as a parent, you needed to actually have a rationale for the action you were taking. So, you know, if the two kids were fighting for a toy, then you take the toy away and you don't get to play for it for a day. Mm-hmm. Or if you can, you shouldn't be doing that because it's dangerous. You know, most parents these days will say. That's not safe for you to do that. You can't do that because that's not safe. It's no longer you have to do it because I'm your mother and I told you to do it. You actually have to have a rationale and be able to explain the rules that you're putting in place. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a huge, huge step forward. And I'm glad to see that that those changes are are making one worry through the system. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. absolutely. It's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. You're kind of talking about seeing a, a much more dangerous world in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. But when I listen to the stories my parents tell or <laughs> that, that my grandparents tell, it seems out of this world uh, different. Like, you know, my, my grandmother, uh, who passed away two years ago, she had nine children. Oh, boy. Yeah. And um, she was talking about how, like, it was nothing to push your baby carriage to the grocery store and you leave your baby yeah. outside and there'd be a whole line of babies outside the grocery store just sitting there and you you never brought your kid in the store. Yeah. The same with leaving your kids in the car and yeah. things like yeah. that. Yeah. What's your perspective on that? Well, I, I think that's right. And I, because I really think it was safer back then. Yeah. You know, and I'm not sure why, I, because, you know, if people have mental illness issues, then there must have been people back then having the yeah. same mental issues. So I, I'm not sure why that is. Maybe we just know more about it now than we yeah. knew back then. I mean, maybe we just hear about it happening when you wouldn't really, you know, it's the days of 24 hour news and, and all that kind of stuff that we've got now. It's it's all that all those stories are very accessible. Yeah. And there's kind of like, it's with dread that you read those stories because you know they're going to make you feel 
sick, but it's kind of like passing a motor accident on the highway. You just look, you know, and it's the same sort of thing. So maybe it's just that there's more, more publicity given to it. And it wasn't, it, it, it's still as a proportion of the population, but maybe the same relative level. I'm not sure, but to me, it seems more dangerous these days. It does. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, I think you're probably right about that. Like though, that, um, about the information just being out there Mm -hmm. and it creating uh, anxiety, anxiety, Mm -hmm. but then also laws, like these different levels of change that have happened in society. Like we could hear about something that's happened in the States, Mm -hmm. you know, someone left a child in a car, someone went to the store to get milk and left their baby home taking it. Now, you know, you hear about it and based on that sharing of information, It not only creates like a vigilance in people, but then also actual legal changes. And yeah, the world seems more scary because of that. That's right. And it may actually, in fact, open up opportunities for people who might be, you know, um, somewhat susceptible to some types of suggestions. Like, you know, you never used to hear about a van running down the street, running over people. No, mm-hmm. it, it's happening these days because one person here, one person hears about somebody else doing it. They think that that's probably an easy way for them to get attention or whatever, you know, and they rent a van and run down the side bike, uh, the, the sidewalk in Toronto. You know, it's crazy. It's mm-hmm. just because it's, there's more information about it happening. It's, it's spread quite widely, you know. Yeah. What's the sense of responsibility you feel as a grandmother? Well, you know, it's interesting. I think I feel more responsible to the parents of the grandchildren than I do to the grandchildren themselves. I mean, I was a working mother and um, my husband and, you know, we know what it's like to be a working couple and having kids and how much stress that puts on you how you need a support system. I mean, I was very lucky. My mother lived here in the city. So if the kids were sick or whatever, I mean, we had a support system and we're determined to be that support system for our grandchildren and our own children. I mean, I think it's, it just takes a whole level of stress off parenting if you know that there's a ready-made backup plan. Yeah. And unlike their parents who are busy making a gazillion decisions a day that can impact on what that child is going to do and be like and their personality. We don't have that responsibility. You know, Mm -hmm. that's the parent's responsibility. And from my perspective, you know, my job is not only to assist, but to reinforce the kinds of messages and rules and things that mom and dad are giving. Mm -hmm. Um, I try very hard to never uh, replace Um, a decision that their parents have taken, you know, can I have candy now? Well, you have to go and ask your mom and dad or no, you're not allowed to, I know you're not allowed to have candy now. I mean, it's, it's, it's it's maintaining the regime that the parents establish. Mm -hmm. And, and in many ways, you know, maybe helping them figure out out what that regime might be. is kind of like, well, did you ever think of saying this instead of that? You know, without pushing advice on just saying, well, you might want to think about doing it this way. Yeah. So, and actually, Lindsay's been really good about being patient when I come up with all kinds of ideas. I think she's been very, uh, very patient. And it's just the whole thing about I'm not the parent, I'm the grandparent. I'm there to help, I'm there to assist, I'm there to reinforce what mom and dad want to have Mm -hmm. and want to establish. Assuming I agree with that. And if I don't agree with it, then I just don't do anything. Yeah. I haven't had that issue yet. You know, I've all been very pleased. But Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's a whole different, it's worry free because I'm not particularly worried about doing anything that's going to countermand what's, what's been set forward or, you know, might ruin them for life or anything like that. You know, Mm -hmm. it's, it's just much more relaxing, much more relaxing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for listening to Stories from Grandparents. If you have any interest in submitting stories or if you want to participate on the podcast, please send us an email at storiesfromgrandparentspodcast at gmail.com. 